Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to share some time with you this evening. Thanks for spending some time with me this way. So you're going to notice that a lot of my slides are, are very minimal. Um, and that is because what I'm really interested in today is kind of sharing stories with you. Um, I think I'm in Minneapolis right now. Um, and I think a lot of folks in Minneapolis and around the world are grieving right now. And we're all coming with different kind of things that we're holding and we're carrying today. And so I just want to be really cognizant of how we show up today and what we're all carrying. And that whatever it looks like for you to be here today, you're absolutely welcome. And I'm so glad you're here. And something we're going to do today is talk about what, what fiber systems can look like, what our textiles could look like, and can look like and how we can do that together um, because it's really a community-based effort. And so it takes all of us to do it. And that's where there's an opportunity for everyone to participate. So just as a grounding piece, um, like Josh said, my name is Maddie Barch. I use she, her pronouns. And I currently live in Minneapolis on Dakota homeland taken under broken treaties of 1837 and 1851. And I would recommend, if you're interested in looking into it, um, the Dakota Language Society, which is the second line of this slide, um, is a 501c3 nonprofit in the Twin Cities um, of Dakota community members, language learners, and speakers who are dedicated to reversing the trend of language loss and raising future generations of Dakota speakers. Um, so it's a really important thing, um, I think, to be grounded in where we are and the work that we're doing. And so... That's a little bit just about where I am geographically. And then as far as my personal connections to textiles, um, I went to school at UW La Crosse um, for art and then ended up transferring to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities for apparel design. I ended up finishing my program with a BFA in sculpture, but it was really focused on textiles. And after school, um, I kind of did what I like to call now fondly, like my year of wool. And so I basically just kind of ended up um, creating a kind of wool program for myself, if you will. So I started taking classes on how to spin, classes on how to weave, um, all sorts of different things. I started planting a dye garden and I live about two blocks from the Weavers Guild of Minnesota and the Textile Center. So very much lucky me for being so close to that. And I honestly just started like watching every video I could about natural dyeing and spinning and weaving and taking classes and reading books. And I was really interested in understanding kind of the, the narrative behind textiles. I really wanted to capture and understand how textiles are made. And in apparel design school, it was really focused on once the fabric is made, what do you want to do with it? What kind of garment, what interior good are you creating with it? And in your second year of the program, it really emphasized computer work. And what I really craved was this tactile, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir right now, right? A very tactile experience. I wanted to be able to spin yarn. I wanted to go to a farm and engage with the people who were growing the fiber. I wanted to see the animals. I wanted to understand the process. I wanted to be able to watch my dye plants go through the entire growth process and produce pigment that then I could use for textiles. And so... I kind of just started doing the work on my own um, and in the process co-founded um, the Three Years Fiber Shed in 2016 with a group of other folks who also have very similar feelings and a, a kind of a cherished heart for knowing where your fiber comes from. And honestly, since then, um, I've kind of dabbled in everything. I interned on fiber farms. I worked at Gale Woods Farms as a farm educator, specifically with our fiber program and natural dyes. So I did programs with summer camps and homeschool groups and adults. Um, and I also worked at a local fiber mill in Hastings, Minnesota, Rachel Alpaca. And so I worked there for about a year and a half and I washed fleeces from alpaca and sheep and mohair goats and cashmere goats and washed one like batch of dog fur, which I know some folks are really passionate about spinning dog fur, but I would say it smells when you wash it, it smells just like a wet dog. So it was kind of a stinky experience, but a good experience nonetheless. Um, and, and I spent time there kind of really learning about the milling process. And that just kind of expanded as I was doing all these kind of handcrafts and learning how to do the things on my own and just started making all these connections. And I kind of was looking as I was doing this journey, kind of moving through, I was looking for 
you know, where's my piece? What, what do I want to be doing? And, and what I really realized is that the thing for me is that it's the connection piece and it's the bringing people together into creating these systems that are equitable and create human and ecosystem flourishing for all. And so kind of that's, that's what my life looks like now is I work in food um, justice and in fiber justice. So as you can see, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on too, I see food and fiber as sisters. They very much are kind of the local food movement. I think the local fiber movement is coming. I think it's already started and I think they'll be very similar in that in 10 years, the way that people are familiar with local food and kind of the passion around it, I feel like our textiles will be very similar. So yeah, that's kind of just my connection and where I'm coming and my grounding. So um, next slide, please. So kind of now that you know a little bit about me and where I'm coming from, I, I really want to kind of set up our conversation with context, because I think that when we talk about anything, it's really important to have context. And especially with something so big as textile systems, uh, fiber systems, because they go back, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right? As as old as our textile traditions are, so are our systems, right? So I think it's really important to talk about the history of what our context of textiles looks like. And I think it's kind of like one area I, I like to kind of emphasize is that there's the intersectionality of textile and fiber systems. And that what I mean when I say that is that textile systems, fibers, crafts, arts, they're historical. They're cultural, they're social, they're political, and they exist at all of these intersections. So if we think about, and I'm sure you can think of a piece from a museum like the Westerheim or another museum where textiles carry a really important cultural meaning. They carry a really important religious significance. Um, there's a way of you know, distinguishing who someone is from the clothing type they wear, right? And this is absolutely something when we think about historical context of clothing, um, distinguishing class, distinguishing roles within our culture, the hierarchy that exists within textile systems, right? So if you were of a certain political or social standing, you could wear purple, but for the rest of us, we wouldn't be wearing purple, um, right? Especially with it coming from a natural dye, which usually was from a snail, um, from the ink of a snail, like that, that was a really specific marker of someone's place in society. And everyone knew that based on seeing that color. And so, and the same thing goes with patterns too, um, specific patterns. And I think about in West Africa and the rich tradition of patterns and what they mean and why you wear certain patterns and the way that, again, it connects with the cultural and religious significance. And there's something that for me, I think is really important to think about that with this context, there's, there's a way to think about how, um, you know, with, with what our textiles look like, they serve more than just functional. They are, they're much more than just functionality. Um, this is something we talked about, uh, Josh Lee and I before this, but I remember a few years ago at the Westerheim, there was an exhibit of sweaters and they detailed how there was a specific pattern around the necklines and the cuffs and the purpose of that was protection. It was protection for the wearer against spirits. It was supposed to confuse spirits so they couldn't get into the garment. And so even with things like knitting patterns, woven patterns, if we weave you know, pieces of fabric into garments, um, you know, that, that there's a lot of significance into it. So I think when we approach textiles, it's, it's really important to think about that. It's so much more than just things we wear, things we have in our home, um, they're they're really important pieces of our culture. And I also like to think about too, that there's interconnectedness with systems of power. And so again, kind of thinking about that hierarchy within textile systems that that has always been a part of textiles, right? You know, my ancestors in Germany and Denmark would not have been wearing purple. Um, but for some folks, their ancestors would have worn purple. And that was a distinguishing thing about their system where they were in terms of power, that hierarchy. And so there's something really special, I think, of taking something as complex as fiber systems and putting it through all these lenses, because I think it helps us unpack something that's really complex in a way that holds nuance, but also can offer solutions. And so it's with this kind of tension, this interplay between 
things that are super complex and hold this huge historical narrative of since the beginning of time when we wore we started wearing clothing and now and how do we kind of grapple with where we are and where we have been and what can we do um, next, next slide please so I would like to just start um, by talking a little bit about kind of our textile systems today and kind of like as a like a brief kind of drop like I don't know what the right word is backdrop there we go um, to kind of where I'm going with this is I'll just talk about a little bit about kind of textiles in western context um, we could probably spend an entire session talking about each one of the things I'm going to talk about so this is your super big you know 30,000 feet bird's eye view of, of kind of textile systems. So if there's things that kind of pop up that you hear as I'm talking, um, kind of make note of it. Kind of, we, There's a lot of opportunity to come back to things and to kind of further study and further expand your knowledge in those areas. So something I think is important again with that interconnection of power is talking about colonialism in our textile systems and that it really is a connection between industrial revolution and capitalism and how that influence really kind of got us to where we are today with where our textile systems are as the speeding up of consumption and kind of then this notion of new is better and the shame kind of that then became associated with conservation and using resourcefulness and reusing items um, that it was just, you know, cheaper to buy something new. Why fix it when you can just get something new? Um, and that again, there's that interconnectedness of who was telling us to do those things? Who was pushing for these things? Who said, let's globalize our systems? Um, and, and what was the reason behind that? What's, what's really at kind of the root of why we have started that? Why, why are our systems that way? Um, and I like to go back to talking about shadow slavery in the Americas for cash crops that, as I'm sure everyone is aware of, is cotton, but also indigo. And that that was another crop that when West Africans were stolen, they were stolen for their ability, their agricultural wisdom, their phenomenal like scientific backgrounds in growing and cultivating indigo as well as cotton. And as we know, if anyone's a natural dyer, indigo is used to be called blue gold. And that was for a very specific reason. And even in the United Kingdom, with their colonization of India, they would force folks in India to grow indigo instead of food. So villages were actually starving, even though they had land, they had the ability to grow things because what the demand was for, what the co colonial system demanded was for this blue gold. And as you know, that really only benefited one party in the system. And so if we think about that as like a backdrop to kind of leading up to this time where the industrial revolution, that's where, right, um, synthetic dyes come into play. Up until 1856, it was only natural dyes. But the advent of synthetic dyes, which are based in fossil fuel or petroleum-based products, started in 1856. And that was absolutely a direct correlation with the Industrial Revolution because there was such a desire to speed things up. We need things to be moving faster. We need to industrialize our systems. And again, it's kind of getting at that, you know, what was the bottom line behind this? And again, it was profit. It was profit. It wasn't to make textiles that were more accessible for everyone. It wasn't so that everyone could wear purple. Um, it wasn't so that we all could have different types of fiber to fit our, you know, unique geographies and climates. It, again, was really focused on this baseline of profits. And so as we look at what's happening in 2021 today with our textile systems, um, I think it's really important to think about who's making our textiles, to ask these questions that I have on the screen. And so, again, this is a super brief overview, but I'll just kind of give you snapshots. So. Who largely makes our textiles in the world right now are women and children. The majority of the people who make our textiles um, live and work in the global south. And the impact of this, there's so many impacts. And so I'll kind of just try to cover a few areas. So there's a human impact. And that is the health of the people who make our textiles. It's the emotional, the mental, and physical well-being of these individuals who are from farming, who are growing cotton, who are harvesting it, who are spinning it, weaving it, dyeing it, then cutting and sewing, 
then packaging it and sending it to retailers, all of those hands that touch that product. There are opportunities for things to be ethical and encourage human flourishing. And there is the opposite of that, which is exploitative and oppressive. And currently the majority of our systems choose the latter. They choose to oppress, they choose to take advantage of, to treat the people within our system, these skilled hands that um, many of us in this room, virtual room, I should say, you know, probably have some of these skills. If you're a weaver, a spinner, a dyer, a knitter, a crocheter, a nail binder, like we have some of these similar skills. So you can imagine the skill sets that you need to do that because you could, you've done some of it. Um, and throughout the system, these individuals, they are abused, they are intimidated, they work in completely unsafe working environments, they are harassed, they end up being part of, um, you know, disasters like the Rana Plaza disaster, where the building, their cries for better working conditions go unheard. And they are the ones who ultimately pay the price for the way that our textile system is. It isn't us, it's not the consumers at the other side of this. It is the folks whose skilled hands are making and creating all of these textiles. So from a human impact, that's one point. There's also the environmental impact. And this is what's contributed a lot towards our climate crisis that we find ourselves in. So our current systems are full of waste. They are full of waste in every single point of the system from how much waste comes from spinning to weaving, to knitting, to cut and sew where there's workable, usable fabric that is not utilized to the destruction of local apparel design communities because of the way our secondhand clothing, um, and this is also another thing, um, you, I think, I'm trying to remember, the Slow Factory is a really good organization and they have a website dedicated to what happens to our secondhand clothing that you can look into. Um, but for the most part, the majority of our secondhand clothing goes to the, to the Global South and it just ends up in their landfills or it ends up decimating the local design and artisan communities there. Instead of their communities being able to utilize each other and the skills within their community to create garments, they are getting all of our secondhand t-shirts from fun runs and sweatshirts that we wore once or twice. And all of that generally ends up in the landfill. So even if it's not in our landfill, which approximately the weight of the Empire State Building is thrown away in the United States as textile waste every single year. So if you can think of that building and think about how much it weighs and imagine that is all textile waste that exists in America. Think about all the waste that leaves our country that is out of sight, out of mind, but it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone that way. And well, not only that, but the water that is often in conjunction with where these um, the manufacturing of our textiles happen. Um, there's a really great movie called River Blue. And it's all about the folks who are doing the dyeing and the dye houses that dye all of our textiles. Um, the impact that that has on their water systems, that there is an adage that in certain countries, um, you know what color is in fashion that year, what color is trending based on the color of the river. And these rivers are sacred. A lot of them are really religiously holy and also they're a main source of food. And so these things are also becoming victims of these systems. Same thing with the synthetic um, textiles that are kind of now becoming much more common to talk about microfibers. So petroleum-based products like nylon and polyester and other synthetics, all of those microfibers are making their way into our waterways. And we're just starting to really grasp the kind of um, the severity of what we're now experiencing. So again, that's another way that our water is being impacted by our textile systems. Air is also impacted by all of the pollution that comes from the manufacturing, the air quality within these places, it causes higher rates of asthma. All of these things, waste, water, air, food, cause higher rates of cancer and other you know, deadly diseases for the people who live in the community, even if they're not a part of the community and actually working in the tanneries. It still is getting into the groundwater, it still is getting into their system and it's making people really sick. And a lot of people are dying because of it. And so, all of this is kind of to think about these intersections, right? There's 
the human cost, there's an environmental cost, there's a social cost as well. What does it mean when an entire culture knows that they are stuck in a system where the only jobs that are accessible are ones where they devalue your humanness, where they tell you that your concerns over very real things like your building collapsing are not necessary, are not meaningful. And then thousands of people die as a result of that building collapsing because your concerns weren't heard. And so navigating these textile systems, so as a consumer, it's notoriously difficult because there's dozens of steps to get you to that t-shirt, to get you to that piece of fabric. And the system is so ripe with oppression at every point because it's really meant to, again, benefit the bottom line of brands. It's really, again, this kind of race to the bottom. With globalization, the reason manufacturing, the reason why our textile systems left is because it was a race to the bottom. It was a race to find the cheapest labor, not for the benefit of the people, not for the benefit of the consumers, truly for the benefit of those who would profit. And so there are multiple intersections of oppression that mirror the impact and reach of colonization. And it also connects with these other systems of oppression, like food access and sovereignty, water, having access to clean, healthy water, health care, to not be persecuted in your job, to not be harassed and abused in your workplace. And so this is really what, when we talk about textile systems and all these intersections, this is what makes it feel like it's such a big thing to unpack, because it is a big thing to unpack. However, that doesn't mean it can't be done. And so um, let's start talking about kind of like what are different ways to think about textiles, because now we have our grounding in what has been, what is, and let's talk about what can be. So next slide, please. So I just wanted you to see this life cycle of a t-shirt. Um, so as you can see on the top left, that's where cotton is harvested. Maybe it's polyester is used from, you know, even recycled bottles or something like that. It's spun, it's woven. So at this point, right, we have the farmer, we have the people who are harvesting it, the people who transport it, the people who are carting it, spinning it, weaving it, the people who are so cutting and sewing it into clothing, the folks who are going to dye it, the people who do washing or other systems, like if it's a denim, um, you know, a lot of times there's things like sandblasting, other techniques that are used to age things. Those things are then transported, all the hands, think about all the hands that transport our textiles to us, the packaging, it arriving in a retail store, all the people within the store who are touching it and moving it and pricing it. And then it ends up with us. And generally, it goes one of two ways. It is recycled, which is pretty uncommon, or it goes into our landfill, it goes into our waste stream. And so as you can see, like this cycle is so large, it's global, it's global in scale. And there's dozens and dozens and dozens of hands that are working together to create one t-shirt. And so what would it look like if at every single juncture, there was human flourishing, there was equitable work environments, and everyone felt valued and heard and understood at every single point. Next slide. So I want to just ask some questions for people to kind of think about. Um, and I, I really like the kind of questions of how might we, um, because I think it kind of can help us think really big and dream about things um, that I, I should say disclaimer, I'm kind of a utopian believer. Um, maybe you laugh or shake your head. That's totally fine. Um, I, I just believe so firmly in the power of community and the power of us to be able to create the futures that we want to see and that I do believe we can do things together when we put our minds to it. So I'm going to ask some questions and these are just kind of things to think about as this slide is kind of rethinking our textile system. So a question I have is how might we root out oppression, rebalance consumption and work as collaborators with land and each other with our textile systems? How can we remove hierarchies and power structures within our textile systems so the bottom line is not the top of the hierarchy? How do we interact with textiles in an intentional way that's rooted in respect, reciprocity, and human flourishing for all? How can we look at our textile systems as an ecosystem 
interconnected and dependent on each other. And kind of something I will say too, before I kind of start to dive into some systems that I like, I care a lot about and are very near and dear to my heart that are some options for us to think about. Uh, before I do that, I do just want to say that there is a thing called greenwashing. And I just want to make you aware of what that is. Um, because I think if you're familiar with sustainable textiles or fiber systems or unfamiliar or just learning about it, um, something to consider is it's called greenwashing. And basically it is, it's kind of a, it's a false commitment essentially to sustainability, but it's using the right vocabulary. It's using the right kind of notion, the right imagery to confuse consumers into thinking what they're purchasing, what they're supporting is ethical, is doing those how might we's, right? Um, and so a really good example of this is, I, I think I just saw it today that H&M was saying something to the effect of that they're one of the most sustainable brands on the planet. Um, and if you're not very familiar with H&M, they are one of the key pillars of fast fashion, meaning that there are new fashions every week in the store. Instead of four seasons like there used to be, there's something like 46. Um, the emphasis is on cheap clothing, disposable clothing, and high consumption. And so when they say, we're really committed to a sustainable future, um, we use recycled polyester. Um, it's, it's a half empty promise, right? Because if they're really committed to kind of the future that they're saying, they would address consumption, which they never do. Because again, for them, profit is king. Profit is what is most important. And so um, as we think about systems and as we think about textiles, um, kind of take things with a grain of salt. And, and part of kind of my, of my recommendation for you later on is to do that education and really kind of examine and also ask questions. Um, I think asking questions is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that especially when you ask brands, when you ask makers about their process, as someone who makes things and grows plants, and if someone asked me about my process for growing dye plants, I would be delighted to share about it because I'm so passionate about the work I'm doing. And I can't wait to share with you about why the way I'm growing things means a lot to me, why it's special to me. And I, I just feel like as consumers, um, asking those questions is so good. And I think a lot of smaller brands and makers have that same passion for sharing their why, their story with you. Um, so keep asking those questions. So next slide. So we have talked about so far things that have been, things that are, and we're gonna talk about what we can do, alternative systems. And so I really like this graphic because on the left you see, yeah, left, <laughs> um, the linear economy. And so that is the majority of our systems right now is take, make, use, waste. And it's just, it's a straight line. It's we get a t-shirt and we use it and it goes in the garbage and that's the end of it. Or it goes to a secondhand store and it ends up in the global south and it ends up in their landfill. Um, so that's kind of the majority of our systems in in the Western world um, kind of exists within that sphere. There's also a recycling economy. And so obviously if you recycle, you're familiar with this where you take, make, use things, and then some things can be recycled. So cans, steel bottles, glass, some plastics, but plastics can only really be recycled once. So there's kind of a timeline for that. Plus plastics are a whole sticky situation of petroleum based products and microfibers and all sorts of other things. But there still is waste. So some things can be, you know, redistributed back into the system, but a lot of it is still that linear. It's kind of just a little bit, right? It's maybe diverting 20% of things, but the majority of things are still going into that waste stream. So one alternative um, to talk about, and I'll talk a little bit about this, is a circular economy. And so that's where you can see in the bottom of the picture, there is no waste because the way things are made and used, everything is reused, repaired, recycled, returned, and it goes back into the system. It's a closed loop. And so the waste from it, there is no waste. There is not a thing as waste in the system because everything 
has a purpose and is really intentional. And this is not a system that's focused on the bottom line in terms of profit. It's focused on the impacts, those intersections of what our textile systems, what our economy could do. Um, next slide, please. So I do wanna say before I kind of jump into some more of these alternative systems that it's important to note that these systems are not new. Um, they may be a return for some of us, but for others, they have continued to practice these types of systems always. And so Western culture has often moved away from these. And again, that's a lot of what capitalism and the industrial revolution really pushed that to the forefront. But that doesn't mean that everyone has. Um, and I do like to note too that if we think about going back a few generations in our family, um, the things that I'm talking about with soil to soil systems, fiber shed, circular systems would be much more familiar. So I think about my family who came from Germany, my family who came from Denmark and were French Canadian. All of those folks would have repurposed things. They would have mended things. They would have believed in no waste. You would have used everything. And a lot of people would have knit, they would have sewn, they would have been able to tailor their own things. Um, that would have been kind of the norm, right? That was, that was what a lot of folks, our families were like, right? We used everything. And, and maybe some of the folks in this audience say that is what your family is like. And that's phenomenal. I'm very much of a similar ethos in that everything can be used for something. And so within this kind of concept of a circular system, which is familiar for some, um, maybe is familiar now, but it's kind of this concept of a newer concept that has come out of this is like zero waste. And so that's where there aren't any waste. Everything goes back into the system to be remade, upcycled. It's so using things like um, when we cut out patterns in fabric, it's done so that the pattern doesn't create any fabric waste. Everything is utilized. And again, if you're a hand weaver or you've had some like really nice fabric before, you want to use all of that fabric, right? Like you went to all this trouble to make beautiful hand woven fabric or you got beautiful fabric. Maybe it's linen from Belgium or it's, you know, really gorgeous wool jersey from your favorite local sewing shop. And I don't know about you, but when I cut things out in patterns, everything is as close as humanly possible because I don't want to waste anything. And so in a circular system, every single part of the system is thinking, how can we do that? What's our equivalent? If it's dying, how can we recycle water? How can we make sure that any chemicals that are used are safe, that are neutralized, and that this water can go back into the system at the end of it without causing any harm to anyone else? How can we continue to recycle that? So another kind of system that really kind of takes this concept and puts it into practice and is very near and dear to my heart are soil to soil systems and fiber sheds. And so a soil to soil system, similar to circular, considers the process from start to finish, meaning from that cotton farmer, from that wool farmer, all the way to the end of that life cycle of that garment where it has been mended, it has been, you know, tailored, it has been shortened, it has been taken out, it's been gifted to multiple people, and it's just it's just well-worn fabric. I think we all have some clothing or textiles in our house. Maybe there are things that have been passed down to us that kind of embrace that concept. When they get to that point, what can we do with them? And so in a soil to soil system and in a fiber shed, those textiles are naturally, naturally occurring fibers and they're naturally dyed. And so they are compostable and they feed right back into the soil health of all the things that our system starts with, right? Our fibers, our dye plants, um, and, and really build in as compost health into our systems. And so fiber sheds also are really kind of have an emphasis on working with seasons and working with the land. Um, and something that Josh actually let me know about because I wasn't aware of it, um, are prim stavers or calendar sticks and their use and the Vesterheim has a selection of these as a way for people to keep track of and connect and have a connection to working with the season. So using that as a calendar stick to kind of keep track of when you would plant, when you would work, you know, when, when you would harvest, when would you take the flax out? When would you do this? 
And fiber sheds really emphasize a similar concept. It's working with the seasons instead of working against them. It's working in harmony as partners with the land in a reciprocal relationship. And it's following nature's lead. So it's not trying to get things to grow in your area. Um, we don't try to grow cotton in Minnesota. It's just not the right uh, climate for it. But other fiber shed branches in the south, out west, um, all over the world, they do grow cotton because it, it makes sense. It works in their climate. It works with nature together. Here we have all sorts of phenomenal protein fibers and a protein fiber is anything that comes from an animal. So silk, things like wool, alpaca, llama, mohair goat, cashmere, angora goats, angora rabbit, all of those things. We excel at having those things and wouldn't you know it, Minnesota is cold. And from a lot of the folks who are joining from the Midwest, it's pretty cold up here. So the fact that we have fibers that complement our climate and also work with nature um, is kind of finding that marriage between the two. It's finding that intersection where you can cultivate collaboration together with nature, but also cultivating collaboration within fiber sheds and these soil to soil systems with each other as communities. It's through these relationships and communities um, that we can really think about how local fiber, local labor, meaning kind of the people who are spinning, weaving, dyeing, and local natural dyes at the core of the work of a fiber shed. It's those three pillars, local fiber, local natural dyes, and local labor. And so this emphasis on these three pillars being kind of from a grassroots perspective of the emphasis on community is at the center of the decisions. It's very similar to like a mutual aid system where the people who make the decisions are the people who are impacted by the decisions. Currently, in our textile systems, the people who are impacted by the decisions do not make the decisions. What would it look like if our systems gave the autonomy and power to the people who know what they need, know what helps them flourish, so that our textiles could reflect that flourishing? And so a fiber shed, is, is its purpose is to do that very thing. It is to create this human flourishing. And... I also like to just mention kind of on the last thing on the slide is relational. And so I like to think about fiber sheds as relational systems. And so if you will work with me here, kind of as a, like you can close your eyes if you would like to, I can't see anybody. So if you're closing your eyes, wonderful. If you don't want to, it's totally fine too, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, imagine if your clothing came with photos and names of everyone involved in creating that garment. So when I went to go buy this shirt, let's imagine with it is a hang tag with photos and names of every single person from the farmer all the way through the person who packaged it and shipped it to the store that I'm now in. How would that change the way you feel about that textile? If you knew all of those people, if you knew all of those hands, those animals, those dyes, those plants, how would that change the way you feel? When someone commented on the color of your textile and said, oh, I love that orange, that's so beautiful. Would it make you think of that dyer who dyed it? Would it make you think of that person whose skill brought that color to life on your textile for you and now someone else is connecting with you through it? What about when it's hot outside and the fiber you were wearing that t-shirt was breathable and kept you cool? Would you think of the farmer who was growing that fiber who maybe was wiping sweat off of their own brow as they were caring for and cultivating that fiber, as they were harvesting it and making doing this for decades, for generations, caring for this crop. And so I like to just, you can open your eyes if you had your eyes closed. <laughs> um, I just like to think about fiber studs are really about that sort of relationship. It's about knowing those pieces and having that connection, not only with people when we see each other in textiles, but knowing the history, right? The connection of where those textiles came from. Next slide, please. And so this is just a, a graphic of what the soil to soil system looks like that I talked about. So you can see uh, the left over there um, where it says sheep, cotton, bast fiber and dye. So that's our soil, right? All of those animals are either, the animals are feeding on that, the you know plants that grow out of the soil, the cotton, the bast fiber, hemp, jute, you name it. They're growing in that, uh, that soil and dye plants are also growing in that soil. So that's where our base, right? That first kind of pillar of fibers and dyes, the second pillar come from. And then fiber and dye processing using local labor. So again, that's that transparency. Like when I worked at Rachel Paca, I would meet the farmer who was a shepherd who took care of the sheep. 
I would know the sheep's name. I'd wash their fleece for them. We would spin it into yarn and that would go to that person. And so like, if it was like Oreo the sheep, Oreo the sheep as yarn came back to that farmer and it was a full closed loop of all of us seeing each other. And there's something really special about that. And so in a fiber shed, there's that for the fiber and dyeing process, as well as the designers and makers. In the metro area for the Twin Cities, we have so many talented designers, makers, artists, and I'm sure where you are, there's many, many craftspeople, artists, makers, designers, who are doing wonderful things and creating really innovative clothing um, that really speaks to kind of these ethos. And so within a fiber shed, it's this partnership, right, of these raw materials that are transformed into workable materials for designers and makers. And then as consumers, those garments, they are embedded with all of that relational connection and that meaning. And then, as I said before, all of those garments can be composted because they are made from natural fibers and they're dyed with natural dyes. And then all of that compost can go right back onto those rangelands, farmland, and create carbon sinks, which are really beneficial for our environment. And they feed the health of everything that comes from that place. Next slide. So now that we've talked about kind of some other systems, what can you do? Because I think it can feel a little bit overwhelming, right? There's such big systems and how do we tackle these things? So I like to emphasize that it's a combination of micro and macro efforts. And so there are things you can do as an individual and there's things we can do together as a team, as a system. And so one of the things I like to emphasize first is like community-based efforts. So that's things like mutual aid for like sidewalks, sidewalk swaps. So in Minneapolis and St. Paul, we have some like community closets where they're just kind of like sheds and people can drop off clothing that you can, it's kind of like a little free library, but for clothing, that's a really great way to divert and basically kind of swap with people. It keeps it in the community. It keeps things from going to waste. And it allows you, instead of to buy something new, it allows you to engage in that kind of mindful consumption of something new without having any waste, right? It's all kind of going right back into the system. There's also things like growing pollinator dye gardens or growing flax together and processing it as a community. There's something really special about where we do these processes together um, that allow us to, you know, grow flax and process it into linen, or we grow dyes together and we harvest them. And then with that rich history, you know, we dye textiles and we talk about the experience of watching that plant grow through its whole life cycle to give us the gift of pigment. Um, you can also connect with local farmers for materials. So whether that's you're looking, if you're a spinner, a felter, um, looking for fiber, Maybe you're looking for yarn um, and being able to find farms who use ethical agricultural practices. So maybe they use things that build soil health. They are really active in trying to be stewards of their land, to have that relationship with their land. And so that's another really great way to find those local materials. And this can be kind of tricky depending upon where you are, uh, but that's where fiber sheds come in. We're a resource to help connect folks to those people so that you can have that, you know, Oreo the sheep and, you know, Jill who's the farmer and being able to see all of those people in your work. Another component is caring for your garment and that's mending and mindful garment consumption. And there's a lot of examples in the Westerheim of this where sweaters, mittens, socks are darned. I'm teaching a darning class coming up and mending class. And it's really about caring for those things going to a tailor when it's a repair, like a zipper, if you don't know how to do that, having someone kind of bring new life into that garment, seeing it the way that my grandparents did where those garments were meant to last forever. And they were meant to be cared for and to think about how can you continue to extend the livelihood of that. Um, another way is with the practicing of mindful garment consumption, it's upcycling and buying secondhand. Um, and we kind of already talked about this too. It's also just swapping. Maybe it's trading with someone, um, but it's a way of kind of diverting, right? That waste stream, kind of turn it back into something and upcycling, taking things and making something new with them. Another kind of, so if those are more kind of personal or micro things, some of them are community-based, they're a little more macro, but another one that I think is really important to emphasize is policy and centering the voice of individuals who are at these intersections. 
So that looks like supporting policy and organizations who are working for worker rights. And especially when they center the voices of the, inter the individuals who are at those intersections within our textile systems by amplifying them and following the lead of those workers. Um, and a good way to do this is to ask yourself, who bears the brunt of environmental racism within our textile systems? Center those voices, center those BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color voices who are at the center and know what they need to flourish. And so there's a lot of groups all around the world who are doing phenomenal work in centering the voices of workers for workers' rights, allowing the individuals to say what they need, how they want to be treated, and there's so many ways that you can support that. Even in the United States, there's a lot of legislation going on right now in Los Angeles because there's a lot of garment workers who live and work in Los Angeles who are not being treated fairly, even though it's American made. So how can we, in a, in a macro sense, help support that? Because then those systems become healthier when they are centered by the people who are a part of them. And also finding those connections between oppression and petroleum-based fibers and fossil fuel industry and seeing like the impact they have on our oceans, everything is connected. So how do the fibers you choose, the people who you support, um, the groups who you, you know, work with, maybe you volunteer with them, how are they seeing those connections and seeing, um, and just kind of being able to see beyond just like an immediate connection, but seeing the whole picture, how are they working for the long-term systemic change that we need. And then the last thing I would recommend is education. And this is, there's so many great documentaries and books and accounts out there to follow and accountability. And what I mean by that is holding brands accountable by asking who, who is making my clothing? How are they making it? What are the conditions of which they're being treated? How is the soil that my plants, the cotton is grown in and the farmers, how are they treated and why? Why are you making 46 different, you know, collections a year? That is too many. No one needs that many, that much amount of clothing. So holding brands accountable is something that Fashion Revolution Week does really well, which starts next week. And it coincides with the anniversary of the Rana Plaza factory collapse, which killed 1,138 people and injured more, many more on April 24th in 2013. And so um, if you go to the next slide, there's a thing called the biarchy of needs. And so this is something that's a really great thing. You can find this on Pinterest and all over the place, but this is something that Fashion Revolution really emphasizes is this is, you know, food pyramid, if you will. Um, you know, this is the way you should think about textiles, using what you have as the pillar, borrowing, swapping, thrifting things, making things yourself where there's that connection, right? And then, if necessary, buying and trying to buy from people who are doing ethical, transparent things where everyone within the system is flourishing. And so you can go to the next slide. And that is where I will leave you for now. So if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank All you right. so much, Maddie. That was mm -hmm. wonderful. And, um, and I know Josh is, got one question that he's going to field um, uh, before we before we sort of close out the program. So go ahead, Josh. There is a question here about uh, being a dye gardener. And I know that's something that you're really passionate about. So Caitlin wants to know, where would be a good place for a novice gardener and a natural, a novice natural dyer to start if they want to grow their own dye garden? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I would say the area of fiber arts that I am the most passionate about um, is probably that is natural dyes. I just love them so much. So I would say, um, I think going kind of with simple annuals um, that you can kind of put into almost any garden. So things like marigolds, zinnias, um, you could do something like dahlias or hollyhocks if you have the ability for perennials. Um, just kind of finding what works best with kind of where your garden, your space is. Um, and from there, kind of finding those dye plants that would work really well with it. There's also a lot of things like you can do herbs. Um, so it can be kind of a cross pollination. Things like mint, you know, you can use as a tea. It can also be an herb. 
And then you can use it as a dye plant as well. So there's some of those things too, where you can kind of cross pollinate with things. Um, and if you're looking for some good resources on natural dyeing, specifically for dyeing, I believe the book is called A Dyer's Garden. I don't know. I think I saw Renee on the call and I, I think Renee, you know, it's what I'm talking about. Um, I think it's called A Dyer's Garden and she does a really great job of even giving you some options for kind of like what the garden could look like and how you could plant different colors in it. So I'd say just have fun and experiment. Um, but a dyer's garden, I'm pretty sure is what it's called. Um, yes, it is. It's a dyer's garden by Rita Buchanan. And that's a really, really good book. If you've never done anything and you're just kind of like dipping your toe into it, um, I'd say that's a really great place to start. Yeah. That's wonderful. And um, we are getting close to time, but I think we have time for uh, a few more questions. And one question would be, um, and this is maybe a larger question, uh, you know, the difference between, and this is from, from Susan, Susan wants to know, it seems there are advantages to being in a rural community and a metro community and different ways to achieve some of these changes based on where you are. You know, how thinking about perhaps some things that we can do today to enact in a more ethical and sustainable way, what are some things that someone who lives really rurally could do right now? And what are some things for someone who lives maybe more urban could do right now? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a really good question um, because it, I think that there are, there are advantages to being able to have access to land or maybe a closer connection with kind of the more agricultural aspects of who's growing your fiber, um, where processing is going on. Um, so I would say for like folks in rural communities, um, I come from rural Wisconsin originally, kind of beyond the Appleton area. Um, and I would say like, if you have the space to start, start a dye garden, um, or even just kind of start a small patch of like, if you want to try growing flax or something, just to kind of experiment with it and to kind of get others involved with it. I think there's a real opportunity within spaces to bring the community together around things, around dye gardens. Maybe you grow indigo and so you harvest it and you process it all together at the end of the summer, or you do that with like flax. Um, I think there's a way to work with folks who are in your community, who are artists, craftspeople, who those sorts of supplies would be beneficial to. Um, and even working with kind of what you can forage too. So I know there's at least one individual who I know um, is an artist and they, they do a lot of work with stinging nettle. Um, so you would process it kind of similar to like flax, kind of similar to hemp. Um, and you can also do that with milkweed to get the fibers out for spinning. And so there's opportunities to even forage a lot of your dye plants from what's around you. There's a lot of native species in Minnesota and the Midwest and actually everywhere um, that are dye plants. And so there's an opportunity to really get to know your landscape and get to know who, who's in there. Um, and there can be a way of bringing more plants in, more native species in, growing dye gardens. Um, but also kind of, again, getting to know that landscape. And I think there's an invitation there to bring folks along with you, whether that's a study group where you just kind of like harvest with the seasons and dye things together and kind of create a natural palette. Um, I think there's an opportunity to do that there. And for folks in urban areas, I think that kind of the call is really similar. It might look different though, because it's community garden spaces, which that's where all of my dyes are grown is in community garden spaces because I live in an apartment. Um, but it's really fun because every time I'm in my garden, I have an opportunity to share with other gardeners what I'm doing because I'm the only person who's growing 32 species of dye plants and everybody else is growing very different plants. Um, and so it's a really fun opportunity to share what I'm doing and get people involved and as well as like offer classes. How can you do some skill sharing, right? Um, kind of a, a way to just level things and make it accessible so people can engage with it, get outside and do these things that are really good for us holistically as humans. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways we can do that both rurally and urban. And also if there's any way you can kind of connect the two pieces, if you can connect with folks in an urban context and a rural context, I think that that relationship 
is so, so important. And I think it's so, so needed in our society. And so why not find a group of people in the cities who are passionate spinners who would love to come help process flax at your farm? So that way, or your, you know, your yard. So that way you can kind of have this connection piece. So, yeah. Thanks, Maddie. I know we want to take at least one more question here. Um, and I just want you to know that if we weren't in a Zoom atmosphere, you'd have wild applause because many of the people <laughs> that put comments into the chat and comments into the Q&A, um, just saying how inspirational it is mm -hmm. to hear someone speaking so eloquently and passionately about these topics. So um, Beth has a question. She was wondering if you could mention again the website that talks about the problems with secondhand clothing. Yeah, um, let me grab it really quick because I, I think it's called, okay, let me see. Um, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's meant to be kind of more of a shocking name. So it's called Dead White Men's Clothes, um, and which is a shocking name, yes. Um, and it really is getting at the notion, and I'll put it in the chat here. It's getting at the notion of where do our clothes go, the majority of folks in a Western context, um, and where do they end up, and what is that like for the people who receive them? So it's a really interesting group. It's also kind of correlates with the Slow Factory, which is another phenomenal group, and they do free um, equitable education all the time about sustainable fashion and textiles from kind of the entire gamut of people's perspective. So I'd also really recommend them as well for, um, for just kind of like further education on some of these things. And I know we're a little bit over time, but I would like to ask one more question since folks have stayed with us for this, this event. And mm -hmm. uh, this question comes from Betsy and it says, when I think about nurturing local fiber systems, I also think about the systems in the global South that have been structured around our consumption mm -hmm. and wonder if reparations for existing textile system workers should be part of our thinking in tandem with building local systems. Absolutely. Yep. I 100% agree with that. And, and my hope for fiber sheds is, is that we see each other as kind of one big community and we all have specialties. And so while we might not grow cotton here, maybe there's a sister branch who does. And how can we have a mutual exchange that's beneficial for both of us? Where again, there's not a hierarchy involved. No one's product is better. So-and-so is not getting a pay paid a fair wage here, but it wouldn't be a fair wage here. It's really this equitable exchange. And I think that within fiber sheds, there's the opportunity to do that and do it together. And I think that reparations based on kind of like the damage that globalization, the damage that colonialization has done on, our, on the global South, I think that that is something that needs to be dealt with. And I think that our textile systems have an opportunity to bring those voices to the center of this conversation and to figure out what that looks like. What does it look like for those communities to flourish? And I do think it does involve that. 